Hey there YouTube, I'm Yukitsu, this is the Yukitsu Times. Welcome to my channel, welcome to a bit of a strange video there. So this video is sort of a response to an older video by a fellow named James Tulos, and I want to get this out of the way really quickly here, but I actually really like his videos. I think that they're quite good, and I do even think that the one I'm going to be criticizing, which is called How to World Build Fantasy Armies, is a pretty good video. It's a resource essentially for world building for writers or a lot of people I know of that uh, sort of play D&D also read those or watch those rather and I think he does a fairly good job of those. Now the reason I'm going to be talking about this and complaining about it has a lot less to do with him and a lot more to do with the sort of books that I've been reading lately. I've been reading books like the Powder Mage trilogy, I've been reading books like the First Law series, I've been reading things like uh, I, I read quite a decent bit ago the um, George R. R. Martin books uh, and uh, I started reading Brandon Satterson and I, I've read a lot of other books as well but I'm not as well read as like a lot of people but I, I've read a decent number of books that have battles in them recently and a lot of what he says is pretty right some of it is actually technically wrong even in the context of those books but what he's talking about and what is in those books seems to represent kind of a hard cap of how we can get history or historical accuracy or the accuracy of the way armies function into our fantasy books. And for me, I just wanted to go a little bit of a step further than what they've got in there. So I have to sort of differentiate different types of history. I don't have to go full into all the different narratives of history, but I do have to differentiate between one and another here. And what ends up happening in both James Tulos's uh, video, as well as in a lot of those books that I've been reading is that history isn't based on history, it's based on a mythologized history. So take an example here. Let's imagine for a second a Roman legionary, or more accurately, let's, ro let's imagine a Roman soldier. And what's going to pop into your head, because I know it pops into mine, is your typical sort of guy with sort of the red, they've got the big shield, they've got maybe two spears, they've got a gladius, they've got the Iorca Segmentata. And that pops in my head, despite the fact that I know that's not really representative of the Roman army, but it's such a powerful image and it's been talked about and told so often that we think of that as the accurate history of the Roman soldier. But the reality of the Roman soldier during the post-Marian sort of period is that the majority of the Roman army was auxiliaries. And that meant that more than 50% of them were people who were armed potentially with no armor or with a light shield and with a sling. Or they had a light shield and some javelins. They didn't wear armor at all. They didn't use a gladius. You also had people who carried spears. You had people who were riding horses. You had all kinds of these other different uh, units within the Roman army, but they don't get talked about. And not only that, but the Roman soldier, the legionary that we talk about, probably wasn't equipped quite like that, mostly in the sense that the colors of their uniform were probably a lot more washed out than we like to imagine them being. There's also probably a lot more soldiers wearing things like chain armor as well as scale armor, depending on where they were and what year it was. Very few people seem to have worn Aorica Segmentata which is the iconic image of the Roman soldier, those sort of plates that you imagine them wearing. And as a result of this, we have to sort of realize that when people are writing about their histories and the idea that that's what the Roman army was is based on real history. It's just that it's based on what was important to those historians. And a lot of those historians from that period were writing about the famous infantry of the Romans. They were the citizens of Rome. So they wanted to emphasize and talk about the exploits of the, the citizens of Rome rather than the auxiliaries or the federati. They wanted to sort of talk about the main hitting force of the Roman army and not all the things that supported it to make it work. So we end up with this very skewed view of history that's not really accurate to sort of picture there. And that sort of mythologized history is how we write our stories because to a certain extent, that is less of a real history and more of a story that's being told. It's more of a propaganda that's being told. 
Now, I don't necessarily think that those historians from that time period were deliberately creating propaganda. I think that those historians probably thought that this is an accurate way for them to write about what was happening. Obviously, the Roman infantry were doing the main work. I talked to like 50 members of the Roman infantry. Uh, I've talked to like 50 legionaries and like a dozen centurions about what happened there. And they all told me that the Roman infantry did everything. So you end up with this sort of very skewed view of history that has to be corrected by going through many, many, many other accounts you have to go through a lot of the archaeological records to find out that there are all of these other weapons, these lists of soldiers that didn't fit into the legionary model. And you had to find out that actually the way that the army functioned was a little bit different than our perception of it. Now, we can still look at the way we view the romanticized version of Roman history and say to ourselves, this still looks and feels fairly accurate because it is. There were a lot of those heavy infantry within the Roman army that were a very vital and important part of what they were doing. And the same sort of goes for knights, which we romanticize from the medieval period. We talk about the samurai for Japan. We talk about the hoplites from Greece. Um, we talk about the lion infantry from Prussia. All of these sort of individual groups were definitely an important and even disproportionately important part of the army, but they're not the army. And when we're looking at the advice by James Tulos, what we're finding is that he's talking about sort of creating a singular sort of image of an ideal that that nation wants to sort of point towards as a representative of their army and saying that that is their army. And things are always a lot more muddy and complex than that. And I think that that's the thing that I'm lacking when I'm reading military uh, action in fantasy stories, where they've sort of got the, you know, you've got a very definitive block of troops that come from this kingdom and everyone from this kingdom fights in this one particular way. Uh, so I think that that can be really uh, something we can get away from and have it still be really, really interesting. So what I'm going to be talking about in this video is just the first section of that video that I was talking about of, of uh, how to world build fantasy armies. And this section, we're not even going to talk about the entirety of it. We're going to be breaking out the section on tribal societies to a certain extent there. I'll still touch on them a little bit, but his talk about tribal society sort of is a through line throughout the entire video. He'll bring them up in each of the other categories and it needs to be addressed sort of on its own because there's a lot there that needs to be uh, talked about. So what I want to talk about here instead is the militia and professional armies. And we'll throw in a little bit from the other stuff about uh, dueling and uh, formations later. So first of all, he talks about the militia. And uh, well, the one thing I need to talk about is that the general premise of this chapter is a little bit off. Armies don't usually function in the sense of they're a militia force or they're a tribal force or they're a professional force. These aren't categories necessarily in the way that he sort of presents them as being. And it's also not categories in the way that they presents it as being in the novels that I've been reading. The reality is that an army consists of people who are from a sort of more informal militia, and you've also got some career soldiers. And it's a slider. You can have nations that slide it all the way in one direction, and you can have nations that slide it all the way in the other direction. Ancient Athens is an example of something that potentially could have been an entirely militia-based force, and the ancient Romans are something that could have been something that you would view as being a purely professional force. And there's probably some ambiguity as to whether or not that's actually true, but you can definitely have it set so that you're one side or the other. The vast majority of nations and their armies are going to be more towards the middle. I think that that's the thing that we need to talk about here. So what exactly is a militia? Well, a militia is essentially any group of people in this context. It would be, just, it would be any group of people who are not full-time soldiers. They're people with another job essentially. So they get pulled into a campaign, they do the fighting a little bit, or they do whatever it is they're, they're there to do, and then they get dumped back into civilian life. This could happen for them every single year, or it could just happen once during a sort of muster for a big battle or a big campaign, or it could be any other number of sort of things that can happen. There's a lot of different ways that a militia can be formed, or a group of civilians can be armed and brought into combat. So you have to sort of realize that when he talks about this, he's not entirely wrong. What he talks about are essentially Greek hoplites, is people who sort of fight in a very disciplined, rigid formation. They're a lot more complex and advanced than other types. They're well equipped. They use their sort of formation as their main strength, their simplicity of their weapons rather than their personal training. All of that sort of thing can be true for this type of, uh, type of infantry, but it's not necessarily that typical of them. So 
on the one spectrum of things, on the one hand of things, Imagine that I'm fighting in a siege and I have conscripted one of the local civilians to form a bucket brigade to do the very, very important task of putting out fires during the siege. He's technically a part of my army. He's technically a member of the, the militia or whatever that I've sort of ad hoc created to, in response to the siege. He's basically also a civilian. Uh, he's a guy who's got a bucket full of water that he's been throwing on the thatch roof so that it doesn't catch fire. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got your sort of ideal Greek hoplite. Well, let's take a look at the life of a Greek hoplite. Usually these people were quite wealthy landowners who had a lot of slaves, and their day consisted of getting their slaves to do all their work for them, going into town, getting into an argument with uh, Diogenes about plucked chickens or what have you, and then going off and learning how to wrestle, because there were a lot of wealthy Greek citizens who did a lot of training in the martial sports to become better soldiers. And that's sort of where they are. They're almost soldiers, despite the fact that they don't quite reach that category there. So you can have militia that are all the way up there in terms of being like probably better trained than a lot of soldiers out there. And then you can have a civilian that's got a badge on him that technically is technically, he doesn't even have a weapon, but is technically a soldier or a militiaman. So again, you get this sort of spectrum here and you've got the sort of wide, wide, wide area in between. And I don't think he quite covers that. He views all of them as being in that one category, whereas in reality, they're sort of a mess that sort of exists in this very large nebulous space. And I do think that there's a certain element of truth in just sticking to one, uh, but there is also an element where you would mix it up within a single army there. So rather than choosing like to have your hoplites, you'd have your hoplites, but you'd also have your um, uh, peltists. And you would have like these people with their very expensive equipment fighting very disciplined formations, keep that shield wall very well trained. But then you've also got these people who are not very disciplined, whose job is to throw rocks at the enemy with slings, uh, who basically fight in a very scattered formation, run up, throw a rock, and then run back behind the people with the shields. And it creates this sort of dynamic where a militiaman doesn't have to necessarily be as formalized as he sort of writes about there. He also says that they're the first sort of organization that would have different units based on their weapon type. This isn't quite true either. Not only is it true that militia could potentially have very mixed armaments depending on how they were recruited, uh, recruited from where and, and so on and so forth, but it's also not necessarily true that simpler societies didn't organize their troops based on sort of role that they were going to be playing or the equipment that they had or so on and so forth. So that part's just not quite true either. Uh, but I, I do think that for the most part, his view is, is one that's accurate but limited in terms of where it sort of fits there. Uh, the next thing that he mentions in regards to the militia is that he talks about how they will sometimes have a small warrior cast. This often misses the importance of the sort of soldiers there. He talks, for example, about the samurai as being an elite warrior caste. They were actually a very predominant portion of the army in terms of like how many there were that were of samurai sort of class in a certain sense there. Uh, this is because there were sort of like middling samurai that were not exactly the people that we think of as samurai, that some, some Ashigaru are considered samurai at certain conditions in certain points in time, gets a little bit confusing. But they did actually form a fairly large portion of the Japanese armies. And the same thing goes for knights during the feudal period. There were a small warrior caste where they were leading otherwise sort of untrained uh, conscripts and so on and so forth. And it, it goes on and on. These groups can be very, very large and meaningful. And this is why I'm saying there's usually a mixture of professional soldiers along with militia. That's sort of more the standard that you're going to find in most uh, nations there. Um, so moving on from there, he talks a little bit about the professional soldiers. And the professional soldiers he gets technically right. There's nothing like too egregiously wrong here. He talks mostly about them in terms of them being state-funded soldiers from sort of the lower classes of society, however. And an example of that would be, for example, the Roman soldiers. They were typically speaking people who had nothing better to be doing in Rome when the Marian reforms came in, and they were armed by the state, and they would fight in sort of these uh, formations and with a very, very good dr uh, drill and discipline and so on and so forth. The same would be said for something like the Prussian line infantry, uh, a lot of other groups that are sort of like that fight in that sort of way. But it sort of dismisses the idea that there is another professional class of soldier, and these ones don't really fit that archetype. 
And these would be people like the Mamelukes, the Janissaries. These would be things, well, actually, Janissaries are probably more like the uh, professional t uh, soldier type. But uh, people like the Mamelukes, people like knights in medieval history, people like the samurai. Um, these are warriors who don't necessarily have that very rigid discipline sort of style to them. And rather than sort of fighting information, they're fighting more as individuals and typically speaking are in it for their individual glory, but they are still professional soldiers by trade. That is their vocation. That is the only thing that they really do. So I do think that there's another way of categorizing these that he sort of misses out on that you could write about within your story. Usually this is going to be a group of people who fit into a certain social caste in society who are expected to be able to fight. And these individuals are going to be fairly different from the rigidly disciplined soldiers that you're going to find in the more uh, professional soldier category that he sort of talks about. And I do think that they're such a huge part of like history that sort of glossing over them as being sort of part of militia focused armies really does them a disservice because they can also be just very vast in terms of how many of them are employed in that sort of way there and how uh, uh, important they can be to the battles being fought by those sort of peoples there. So I do think that that needs to be mentioned as well. So that gives us our two different types of soldiers that he brought through there. Again, it's not that they're, these are real categories. They're not really real categories. They're instead a sort of spectrum that you can be along there uh, where you've got some people who are more like, uh, you've got some armies that rely more on professional soldiers, some armies that rely more on militia. You've got some militia that are more like civilians and some militia that are more like professional soldiers. You've even got some professional soldiers or warriors who are just sort of on the cusp of not really qualifying as professional soldiers. For example, somebody who serves in a modern military for four years is usually considered a soldier by most people, not a militiaman, but then they end up on a reserve list for like years after that. And four years is not long. It could be less than a campaign. If you started off in Afghanistan and left before the end of the Afghanistan war to return to civilian life, you're actually getting off of that war uh, faster than some people who might have been in a militia in Afghanistan. So there's a lot of blurred lines in terms of where the boundary really hits and the distinction of what differentiates a top level militiaman from a bottom tier soldier. Um, and then of course you've got the people who are like in the army for like 50 years or whatever. So there, there's again a lot of just sliding scales that you should be looking at instead of these categories that he sort of, he, he conveys them as being a little bit harder categories than they really are. So. Anyway, how do we decide where our society fits in this? So you can just try and create your army and make it sort of, it's, so it's interesting, so that it draws from history, so that it's the way that you want it to be. But there are certain things that will indicate whether or not your army relies more on militia or more on professional forces. And the biggest, most important one is whether or not you have a totalitarian government or not. A heavily authoritarian, totalitarian, top-down government is going to have a very strong professional army and thus professional army is usually going to give a, ra a raised social status and extra privileges that makes them very invested in maintaining the status quo. So they're going to fight against anything that tries to threaten the current way that things are within the state, including like rebels, uprisings, stuff like that. They're going to be very loyal to the establishments that are existing there. Um, you could have very strong power struggles amongst the top generals and so on and so forth for the crown, but for the most part, you can expect that they're at least not going to abolish the state in favor of someone who is not an absolute tyrant. By contrast, the militia are going to be a little bit de-emphasized. You can still have this very authoritarian government rely on a very vast pool of conscripts. The thing is, if you have these sorts of militiamen, you don't want them to be permanently under arms. You don't want them training during the off seasons you don't want them to be well equipped and knowledgeable about their weapons because if they are they can overthrow the government and if you're a totalitarian dictatorship you want them to be able to bulk up your army when they're needed and then go back to the civilian life right after that that's sort of how you're sort of going to view your militia by contrast if you're looking at a more democratic society and note that when we're talking about fantasy we're usually talking about air quotes more democratic like a nice king for example uh, but these societies are generally speaking going to have the local population uh, more heavily armed. The reason is that if the local population wants to overthrow the whatever, 
they've got more chances of being able to do so without having to go to arms for it. So if it's a true democracy, they can actually just vote for it. If it's a relatively kind king, they can just talk to him. Uh, if it's a group of like nobles or something like that with privileges, they can petition them, uh, bribe some of them, pay them off or whatever. And as a result, they don't need to result to a military coup to depose the king or the prime minister or whatever. Uh, they're more likely to get things done the other way. So the government doesn't fear them. As a result, they can reliably have them be armed and equipped and well-trained. So they might have a thing where each of these people, like a couple days a week, just goes off and trains and is permanently uh, a competent fighting force. The other thing is that the democratic societies are not going to want as strong of a permanent military. The reason here is that while they're not afraid of their own citizens, they are potentially going to be afraid of a military coup because a powerful general leading the army, if you don't have sort of a militia or other sort of uh, measures to counterbalance that, could just potentially take office and uh, form authoritarian control over everybody, at which point they might have to fight like uh, a bloody like uh, rebellion. But for the most part, what you're looking at is more democratic societies can lean more towards militia, more authoritarian societies rely more on professional militaries. The other thing to consider, more wealthy states are capable of holding more professional armies. Uh, this is because professional armies are extremely expensive. Now, you're also going to tend to see more professional armies cropping up and more professional soldiers cropping up in areas where there is just constant conflict because it makes more sense to have a standing army if you're going to be fighting all of the time. But even in those instances, you're also going to find them having a bit more of an emphasis on uh, a martial society within the militia because they're going to have to dredge them up like every summer so that they can fight and then they can go back to their jobs during the fall. So whether or not they're fighting a lot is going to dictate like how, essentially that's not the ratios, that's more how militarized their society is as a whole. And the last thing that I would sort of consider in this kind of sense here uh, is Oh God, this just fell completely out of my brain here. Um, well, there's probably other considerations and factors, but uh, we'll leave this as it is for right now. There's just lots and lots and lots of things that you can look into to determine whether or not your society is going to be uh, shaped one way or the other. Ah, I remember what it is. Uh, you're going to have specific parts of your army that are more likely to be professional than they are militia. And it's based on the complexity of the job that they're doing. So if you've got a large group of people who are carrying spears and shields, this is not entirely that complex to learn how to fight uh, in that sort of way there. By contrast, if you've got people who are being siege engineers with cannons and dealing with gunpowder and stuff like that, it's very, very difficult to find people that you can just pull out of the streets, give them a primer in like one week and have them be an effective artillerist. So you're going to have certain groups within your army that have very, very complicated tasks always become professional soldiers because it's impractical to keep finding and hiring new people to fill these very specialized roles, these very technical roles. Things that are more difficult to do are things like cavalry. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to learn how to ride a horse effectively, especially to fight from horseback. Being a horse archer especially is a lifelong endeavor. Uh, being an effective longbowman or a composite longbowman is something that apparently takes a very long time, so quite often you'll have those be more professional. I should note that in that case, the English were able to sort of just have their people train every sort of week, even if they were a civilian. And as a result, they had the skills to be an effective long moment without being professional soldiers. So there are cases where you can have groups of people become a militia, even though they need technical skills. So when I'm saying that this, there's these groups of more technical types of soldiers that require more skills. I'm not saying this is a hard and fast rule where they will instantly be professional because they're in this category. Uh, it's again, more likely to become professional soldiers because they're in this category. So uh, in addition to like all of those, you've also got people like um, uh, sappers or engineers or things like that. You've got uh, people like grenadiers or royal guardsmen, just very elite formations, usually are a little bit more likely to be part of a professional standing. and you should sort of go through the army and what you're going to include in it and sort of figure out where they stand in terms of how professional they are and what sort of prestige they have within what they're doing. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I think that that's the best way to conceptualize how you should build your army. Rather than saying that there are these different types of armies, it's all about sort of sliders that you can sort of move along a scale and adjust like how bright it is or how dark it is as compared to uh, switches that go on or off. Now, the next thing that he talks about, which I'm going to throw in here, is uh, unit cohesion. Uh, it's not really related to the same topic, but he does throw it in here, so I will as well. Now, unit cohesion, he talks about how formations should remain together and should not break up when they're fighting each other. And this is kind of true. Formations are supposed to try and stay together as best as possible. However, there are instances where they break down. Now, generally speaking, when one side has their formation break down, deteriorate, and you end up with cracks in it, that side generally tends to flee. If you've got it so that neither side cracks, then you're just going to have them rubbing against each other for a lot longer until one of them eventually does. Uh, but there are rare instances where both formations break down, both formations lose cohesion. In that instance, you can have both of them sort of retreat from each other and try and regroup a little bit, or you can have one route the other one because one of them decides to flee while the other one tries to push onwards. And rarely you'll have fights where both formations break down and both sides continue fighting. And he's right in saying that this shouldn't be everything that you write. You, you shouldn't use this all the time in writing. The reason that this happens in literature so often is because it's the most interesting, intense, uh, dangerous type of battle that you can be in, where everything's chaos and no one knows exactly what's going on. And it really sort of portrays the sort of deadly, confusing kind of warfare that's more exciting to read about. But the reality is it shouldn't be used very often. It's overused in literature rather than being an impossibility in actual combat. So I do agree with him that you shouldn't necessarily be writing these into every single battle like a lot of people do. The next category that's still in here in this chapter for some reason is duels. He says that they should not be used in battles. This is just not true. Uh, battles were actually used in a lot of combats. Now, he is kind of right in a certain sense. We'll sort of get into the details of that. But basically the way that ancient duels uh, would work in combat or even sort of fairly later on, both sides would pick a champion or a representative or a group of people and they would fight each other while the rest of the army sort of watched. And one side or the other might emerge victorious. And if it's a crushing defeat for one side, that side might decide this fight is not worth doing. We're really outmatched. Those guys are really badass. Let's just give them what they want and go home. And the side that sort of won those duels and won that and saw, oh yeah, no, we've got this. They're still probably going to look at that and say to themselves, well, we don't really want to have to fight this really big battle. We'll agree to the things that they're giving us. So we'll take that and then we'll go home. And what this essentially was, was a method for both sides to de-escalate the conflict, going from a full-scale battle where countless people might end up dying to something where only a specific number of people were likely to die, or maybe even very, very few people were going to die. And this is because it's it's difficult and expensive to fight these kind of battles. Um, generally speaking, you just don't want to, as a society, commit a whole bunch of your people to this kind of fight if you can help it. Even if you're going to be victorious in that in the end, losing that many people and that much uh, experience in your soldiers and stuff like that leaves you really weakened. So. People wanted to find these ways to sort of have outlets for de-escalation, essentially, in combat. And even as that became less the case, they became formalized and ritualized and remained sort of in customs in certain places for a lot longer. Now, the other thing is that uh, duels did technically happen seemingly in the middle of battles, where you'd be fighting a battle and someone would call it someone else and they would fight one-on-one. -on -one. As far as my reading goes, the only time that I've ever seen evidence of this happening is in Japan, and the evidence for it is that it's just taken at face value by the Japanese soldiers that are fighting the Mongolians, that that's how you're supposed to fight wars. Because they're all writing about how they're really confused in their memoirs, essentially, about why the Mongolians won't answer their calls to challenge them to 1v1 combat. And the Mongolians probably aren't 1v1ing them in combat because they don't understand Japanese for one. And for another, they probably don't care to 1v1 them. Um, so that instance there sort of indicates that in the societies where they did do that, it was not necessarily something that uh, they would think to comment on or record as happening because it was just the way that you fought those battles. Now, I do think that it should be you know, used extremely sparingly or basically never used at all in literature because it's so rare. But 
it is something you could have in your stories and have that be uh, potentially accurate. Now, the real way that you would look at this is that you can write a duel into your battle scene if you're zooming in very closely between two combatants here. And the th reason is that imagine, for example, that you've got your uh, two-handed S-Dock or something like that. You're wearing your full plate armor. You've got plenty of room to your left and right, so you've got room to swing your sword and maneuver around the battlefield a little bit. Um, and the same thing is going on for the enemy formation that you're approaching. So you start fighting that enemy formation in front of you. Now, if I decide that I'm not going to uh, fight the person in front of me, I'm going to go help my friend on my right here, and I'm going to go stab the guy that he's fighting. What's going to happen is I'm going to get run through the, by the person in front of me. Same thing if that person in front of me decides to kill the person to my right. If he decides he's going to get distracted and start dealing with that guy, I'm going to run him through. And that means that both of us have this really strong vested interest in maintaining a fight between the person in front of us. The same thing goes to the person in my right. He has a person that he should be fighting, and if he sort of deviates from that, it gets a lot more dangerous for him, and so on and so forth down the line. So while it's true that neither side is, strictly speaking, in a duel, it can be written as a duel. It can use all of the language of a duel. You can even use the word a duel, because you've got one opponent in front of you, and you have to focus on that one primarily. Now, the great thing about this sort of thing is that you can break up the duel by having things that are outside of it pop into the fight and remind you that there is actually a battle swirling around, around beside you, in front of you, all around you, uh, other soldiers doing that same thing. And if the person to your right, for example, dies, there is that brief period where there is a gap beside you before someone behind you can take his place, where you might very well get blindsided by the person that used to be fighting him. Uh, there's that sort of brief moment where you have downed your opponent and you're looking for a new one, no one steps forward, so you take out that guy that's fighting your friend to the right, and so on and so forth. So there are brief moments where you can break it up, but you can write this as though it were a duel, even though it isn't one in a strict sense there. So that is pretty much everything I needed to talk about here. Um, in terms of his video there. Like I said, there are other chapters that he, or other categories that he talks about in his video. I'll address those sort of separately. But yeah, this is going to be the one on how to sort of form up your army. So anyway, I hope you found this video enjoyable. And of course, as always, hope to see you guys all next time.